Hello! A couple of days ago somebody sent me a nice email asking if I might do a bit of a description of SIDS and STARS for instrument flight in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So, we are here at Solar Airfield near Stavanger in Norway and we're going to do a short flight over to Torp Airfield near um, Sandefjord on the other coast of Norway, on the east coast. So. We're going to go and jump in the 737 and we're going to have a bit of a talk about setting up or using standard instrument departures and standard terminal arrival routes. So before we get going then, let's go and do a bit of flight planning in Little Nav Map. So we're going to cover lots today. We're going to cover not only how you can use Little Nav Map to help you figure out the route for the big jets, we're also going to have a little look at Navigraph, see how it compares, how it's any different to Little Nav Map. And then we're going to actually program the route into the 737 and then fly it. So I've put the basics of the route in already. Let's start from scratch though. Let's do new flight plan, nothing. So we're going to go and look at solar in the uh, in Little Nav Map. We're going to say set solar as the departure airfield. OK, and it appears on the flight planning list over here. Then we're going to go over to ENTO, which is the ICAO code for TORP. We're going to right click on it and we're going to set TORP as the destination. OK, so now we have a yellow line in between solar and TORP. But that's not enough because you can see from where we are on the ground the wind is coming in from this direction, so we probably need to take off on runway 18. So this, this, by the way, we are just inventing a route. In the real world, you would have an operational flight plan which would tell you your route. I'm just showing you a way you can invent a route. OK, so what we're going to do is right click on solar and we're going to show the departure procedures for solar. If we zoom out a little bit so we get an idea of what's going on here, you can see there's a whole load of codes here with SID and a sequence of letters. Those are the identity of the standard instrument departures. And notice they've got runway numbers. So we want the ones for 18. So there's one of them, look. And it's superimposing it onto the map to show us how it would look. There's another one. There's another one and you can keep looking at them and find one that broadly fits where you're trying to fly. So that's looking pretty good, isn't it? So the Upley 1G standard instrument departure for runway 18 looks like the one we want. So we can right click on it and we can insert that into our flight plan. So notice the yellow line now starts at the end of the standard instrument departure. And you'll notice all the standard instrument departure really is, is a sequence of waypoints so when we come to program the aeroplane, we could actually program all of these by hand. Yeah, we don't have to though. Notice there's also some restrictions associated with specific waypoints. So if we look, zoom in on this one, it wants us to be below 250 knots when we come through ZV422. Okay, so sometimes the waypoints along the way in a standard instrument departure have restrictions, either in terms of altitude or airspeed. And it could be for any number of reasons. Could be that, you know, there's another airway coming through at a slightly different altitude. Could be there's a town nearby and they want aircraft to stay below a certain speed to keep the noise down. All sorts of reasons. Okay. So you can see that line is still is going straight to TORP at the moment. So we need to figure out how we're going to come into TORP. So if we hover the mouse over TORP and just let go, you can see this panel pops up and there's METAR. I can't actually move the mouse to show you it. You can see there's a METAR line there. And it says the wind is coming from 200 degrees at eight knots. Okay, so it's coming from over here somewhere. So we need to land on runway 18. So what we can do is right click on TORP and show the arrival procedures for TORP. So notice it has stars and approaches. So a standard terminal arrival route gets you into the right place to then approach the airport. So it's kind of the, you know, the outer part of the routing. And then the approach gets you onto the runway. So let's have a look at these. Knowing we want to come into 18, let's do the approach first. We want to do the ILS approach into runway 18. Yep. 
So if we zoom out slightly, so if we right click on that one and insert it, that, so notice it's moved the yellow line. But we don't really want to do that. We want to do a star as well if we can, just for, you know, for the interest. You don't have to do it, but for the interest of doing this, let's, let's have a look and see what the stars look like. So there's one. Let's zoom out a bit. So there was one of them coming in from the northeast. There's another one coming in from the south. There's another one coming in from the east. And here's one look coming in from the west. So Ulmu 2S. So if we right click on that, if we insert it, notice it's joined all the bits up for us. So we now fly into Ulmug. Then we follow the standard terminal arrival route. And then we fly across to the approach. So notice though, the star or standard terminal arrival route has a lot more restrictions involved. So it wants us below 15,000 feet at Ulmug. Then it wants us above 4,000 feet at Mopap. Then above 3,000 at Bapto. And then you're coming in at 3,000 feet for the entry into the, the ILS beam. So just out of interest, we can see on here the elevation of Sandefjord is 286 feet. So 2,500 feet above that, you're looking at 2,800 feet for the ILS beam there. So you're only going to lose a couple hundred feet. So you'll be descending as you leave Arobu to come onto the ILS beam. So, you know, a little bit of mental arithmetic along the way and, and a little bit of practice maybe in the simulator, because that's what simulators are for. And you soon learn these sorts of things. OK, so that's the route, the basic route in Little Nav Map, which is a freebie on the Internet. This program is completely free. How might this look in Navigraph? So we've got exactly the same route in Navigraph. OK, the huge advantage that Navigraph has, and it works in much the same way Look, you can choose your departure, you can choose your runway, you can choose your arrival or star and you can choose your approach. The huge advantage it has is it has the real world diagrams that a real flight crew would have. So if you are learning to interpret these diagrams for a pre or professional career, for example, or just to make your flight simulator experience that much more rich, then that's where Navigraph comes into its own. But of, of course, Navigraph isn't free because these things have to be maintained and drawn and updated all the time. But it's interesting, look, you can see on a, an approach plate like this one, there are multiple routes drawn and you get information and the, they are never a uniform layout. You have to scan all over them to find out what you're looking for. But they do have typically the same information. So you can see here on this standard instrument departure, there's the transition altitude is given. So that's where you switch over to uh, standard barometric pressure. But if you remember, if we have a look down here, yeah, initial climb clearance is 6,000 feet. Expect further climb from ATC. So this has information that Little Navmap didn't have. It's got the other information, look, max 250 knots at ZV422. But this sort of information and, you know, further more detailed information about the local area, Little Navmap had none of that. You've also got some procedural instructions there, look. It's very, very good. And it can do the same as well for the standard terminal arrival route. So if we go and have a look at that, you see there's the diagram look. It's like above 15,000 feet, below 4,000, above 3,000. And then we come in. See, this is only the start. It's not the rest of the route. So if we go and look at the ILS, we can suddenly see a much more detailed view of that ILS. And there's almost too much information on an approach plate. But you get the ILS frequency and the direction. You get reference information for altitudes and distances on the way in. It's very, very cool. So that's what Navigraph gives you over and above what, Nav uh, what Little Navmap will give you. OK, so let's go and jump into the aeroplane and start getting it ready. And then we can see how we program all of this into the flight management computer. So now we're inside the 737. OK, so we press Control and 6. So we go overhead, we turn the batteries on and close the cover on the battery switch. We go to Control 3, which is the FMC. 
we go to the FS Actions menu, we go to Ground Services, and we request ground power to be connected to the aircraft. If we go and look outside, we can see the car is there, the door is opening, the wire will go in any moment, there it goes. And this will say release in a moment, meaning it's plugged in. Okay, so then we go back overhead, control six, and we can immediately switch on the ground power. And the aeroplane starts to come to life all on its own. So let me go further overhead, and we are looking for the IRS switches here. So we can turn the left system to align, and it will say align when it's doing it. And then we turn the right system to align, and again it says align when it's doing it. And then we can switch the monitor to heading STS, and it will tell us how many minutes until alignment. I think I've got it set to instant so we don't have to wait for it. So there's a realism setting within the 737. If you have it on realistic, you're sat here for eight or nine minutes waiting for it to align itself. Which wouldn't be such a problem today, actually, because we'll be messing around programming the flight in and talking about it. OK, so control six. We're going to go and arm the emergency lights. So that's the switch in the middle here. So we put it into the middle and then switch, flick the lid on it. Window heats. We go and turn on the window heats and the probe heats. Then we go down to the bit we're interested in, the FMC. So we'll go to the menu page, which is the front page of the entire system, and it says enter IRS position. OK, so we go to FMC and we go to pause in it. So this is called the scratch pad at the bottom, by the way, but it also shows messages on the same line in the Boeings. So if you want to get rid of that message, you can just press clear. So it wanted us to enter the position of the aircraft. So we can go to pause in it. And you can see there's a sequence of boxes here, the square boxes, that means that's a mandatory field. If you see hyphens, that's an optional field, but this is a mandatory one. So where do we get the IRS position from? Turns out this is page one of three. If we go next page, we can see the GPS location from the aircraft's onboard GPS unit. So we can select that and it drops the number into the scratch pad for us. And then we can go previous page and then having, we, we could key this in. Yeah, you can see I'm able to, to type into here or press clear to backspace through what I've typed. So having got this value into the scratch pad, we can drop it into the IRS position and that's done. We can now set our reference airport. So this is where we are flying from. OK, so let's do this from Little Nav Map because this is the freebie and lots of people use it. So Echo November Zulu Victor is the airport we're flying from. So Echo November Zulu Victor. So drop that into the reference airport and it's got the location of the airport as well. It's slightly different than where we are because that'll be the center point of the airfield. OK, so then we go route. So a standard practice in the FMC of the Boeings is the next thing to do is at the bottom right, typically. So there's a bit of a kind of a managed pathway through doing things. You don't have to do it, though. These buttons will take you to the same pages. So if we go route, we're going from Echo November Zulu Victor. Notice it's already in the scratch pad, so it helps you to drop that in there. And then we're going to the destination, which is Ento, Echo November Tango Oscar. So Echo November Tango Oscar. So all this is saying at the moment is where we're going from and to. So a bit like when we were in Little Nav Map, we initially just put the basics of the route in. We can put a flight number in if we want. Again, if you had an operational flight plan with the route all, you know, keyed into it, then you could reference that. We can put in the runway we're taking off on. So that was runway 18 at um, S Solar, wasn't it? So drop that into the runway. And then on the next page of the route, we don't need this. We are not doing any airways. We're just flying straight between the standard instrument departure and the standard terminal arrival route. So we're not following any airways on the way. So we don't need to put anything into the route page. So the next thing we have to do then, because we're not putting a route in, is go to the departure arrival button and go to the departure 
it already knows we're on run we're taking off runway 18 because we've already told it but it doesn't know what standard instrument departure we're using so let's have a look we're, we're going to use the Upley 1G standard instrument departure yeah so notice it's not on the screen we can go next page keep pressing next page until it comes up and, and there it is Upley 1G so we'll select it so we've now got runway 18 and Upley 1G and then we can go to route and activate that route and execute now if we go and look in the legs page now you can see those are all of the waypoints that have been pre-programmed in so just by naming the SID has put all of the waypoints into our route for the aeroplane but we're not complete yet are we all we've done is told it how to leave solar we haven't told it how to get to um, torp so if we go to arrival we say we want to do the ILS into runway 18 and we want to do the Ulmu 2S standard terminal arrival route so if we select both we can do the same trick again and we can execute the change if we go and look in the legs page now so that's our leaving solar if we go next page you'll see there's some discontinuities or gaps in the flight plan so what those are are the yellow bits in little nav map so the aeroplane will not figure out how to get from uplev to ulmug all on its own it's saying well you've got a gap there and again there's another little one over there look between the end of the star and the beginning of the approach so we don't actually want to do anything special in those parts of the route so what we can do is close these gaps up and the way you do that in the Boeing is you select the waypoint below and then select the gap and it pulls everything up do the same here look we've got CI 18 which is the beginning of the approach so select it and then select the blank line above it and it pulls it up so then press execute on those changes and if we now go and press F to look in the cockpit oh we still haven't got the um, system up and running yet so it hasn't aligned oh that's interesting maybe it just wasn't showing the number earlier yeah it's still saying align at the moment let's just go and have a check of that oh we need to go to nav <laughs> so yes yeah, there we go look you'd think I'd know this by now wouldn't you anyway um if we change the this is the navigation display on the right in front of the pilot if we change this knob up here to plan mode so this this knob controls the display mode of this screen so normally when you're flying along you would have it in map mode but you can put it into plan mode when it's in plan mode it's north facing towards the top and you'll notice now on the legs page there is a center marker yeah and there's also a step button at the bottom right so every time I say step it's going to move the map so let's zoom this out slightly the, the zoom control works here so there's us on the ground We've, we're centered on ZV422 which we can see there's a center marker there every time we do step it will go to the next part of the way of the um, the route so this is called a gross check of your route so we can just go and follow the route keep clicking step and see if it makes sense looks good doesn't it and then the, the dotted line there is the missed approach so we're, we're not going to worry about that okay so once you've finished doing your check of the route you can put this back into map mode go and press legs to put you straight back at the top of the legs page and your basic flight plan is done but we're not finished with the FMC so if we come back and look at it we need to go to the init ref page and we need to fill in the performance calculations for the aeroplane okay so to start with we are going to put in our cruise altitude so we're going to climb to 18,000 feet so we can shorthand that and put what's called a flight level in flight levels are in hundreds of feet so 180 hundreds is 18,000 so if we drop that into there it understands what we mean and puts FL in front of it if we had typed 18,000 it would still say FL 180 because it would understand what you meant 
zero fuel weight it can calculate it for you so you just click the button and it puts a number in here and then click again and this is your zero fuel weight reserves again we'll put two tons in cost index this would be on your um, operational flight plan it is a number that governs how aggressively the aircraft can accelerate so you know how much fuel you can burn basically it's anything up to about 200 I think it varies on different models of aircraft um, but uh, yeah if on an economy route you may be looking as low as 20 so we'll put in 100 on the cost index so we're going to drink fuel and we can execute those changes then we can go to the N1 limit so this is the the climb profile for the aircraft we're going to leave it alone notice you can derate the climb there's various reasons for that I'm not going to get into them why you might do that okay so we'll say take off don't worry about my controls glitching so take off on the takeoff page it needs to know the flaps we're going to use so five degree flap and that's then pre-calculated the rotate speeds for the aircraft so the call out when we're accelerating down the runway will happen at 129 knots so we just click the buttons next to them and it transfers those numbers across for us. If we click next to the centre of gravity, it will work out the trim level so the aeroplane doesn't start to raise its nose until it gets to flying speed on the runway. So in other words, it's trimming the aeroplane so at rotate speed it will be in equilibrium, the nose won't go up or down. So 5.57. So the way you do that is you look at the wheel here in the cockpit and you roll the wheel to move this needle. So we're w waiting for the needle to slowly move and we wanted... let's just go and have another look... 5.57 it's not an exact science it doesn't have to be perfect but it just gets the airplane in the right kind of ballpark with its configuration okay so the next thing we do is go over to the MCP so we'll press control and one and the MCP is up here, this is the master control panel for the autopilot so we can pre-configure most of this so we know we're taking off runway 18 so we're going to change the heading to 180 degrees so when we turn the autopilot on, if we did want to use heading mode for whatever reason we can because we have a flight plan and we have no discontinuities in it if we turn on the flight directors you can see FD has appeared at the top of the screens along oh it has, actually it hasn't got a crosshair yet but we won't worry about that but it's got FD written up there the autopilot in the Boeing's there's two parts to the system there's the flight director which is looking at the flight plan figuring out what it needs to do and then there's the autopilot which follows what the flight director tells it to do okay so we've switched on the flight directors once you've done that you should be able to click the various buttons that will allow navigation to happen so if we even without the autopilot on we should be able to pre-select LNAV and there we go it will light up because we have a complete flight plan and the flight directors are on if those two things are not in place it won't switch on LNAV so LNAV is lateral navigation it means the airplane will steer the route all on its own VNAV is vertical navigation, that means the aeroplane will climb through the restrictions automatically. So if there are any restrictions, and if you remember, go and look on the legs page, you see there's various heights that it's going to come through on the way out. In the real world, you wouldn't do that, because in the um, standard instrument departure plate, it said only climb to 6,000. Now the aeroplane doesn't know anything about that all it knows is the technical limits of the climb and 6000 is a request it's not a you know a mandated um, it's not a blue number on the flight plan so we, we could simulate it for our own purposes and say only go out to 6000 on our initial altitude here so that's our, our target altitude which you can see above the ribbon there so if we were to say VNAV 
the aeroplane will climb to 6,000 obeying any restrictions on the way, and there aren't any, so it will just climb out to 6,000 feet. But it will stay below 250 knots at ZV, ZV422. So below 10,000 feet anyway, air law says you stay below 250 knots anyway. So we're going to go and set our target airspeed for the autopilot, for the autothrottle, to 220 knots anticipating that we will then up it to 250 as we're making the first few turns. Okay. We can go and I think we can switch the auto... Yeah, auto throttle can come on now. It won't kick in until we're on the wrong way and we push the throttles all the way forwards anyway. So, notice we don't need to use heading select mode. We're using LNAV. So in other words, the aeroplane's going to follow the flight plan line. This is a bit bright, isn't it? Should we turn it down a bit? Just click the button next to it a few times. OK. So we've done the master control panel configuration. Notice we haven't turned the autopilot on yet. So we would press the autopilot command button, which would mean the autopilot takes over control of the aeroplane when we do that. But we're not going to worry about doing that just now. So, on the instrument panel, we are going to preset the barometric pressure. So we're going to press B to do this. If you do it by hand, what you're looking at is this number here. And you're wanting to get it to the local barometric pressure. So you can choose the format of it, whether you want inches or hectopascals. So if I do this from the pilot's seat, if you watch this number, if we roll this, notice the altitude changes. That's because the altimeter uses barometric pressure to to know how high you are above sea level. So if we press B, it will do it automatically for us. So yeah, we're at sea level at solar, look. Okay. So let's go and get on with the rest of the getting the airplane ready. So overhead control six, turn the seatbelts signs on. So seatbelts, oh I'm gonna be thoroughly awful at this now so it goes to automatic I'm so rusty with the 737 your damper goes to on cabin pressure we're going to set this to our cruise altitude which is 18,000 feet fuel pumps our fuel pump one to on so our fuel pump number one goes to on the reason we're doing this is to give the pump to the APU so APU we switch it to on and then pull it down to start and let go and you can see the exhaust gas temperature of the APU is down here and it will start whizzing round up to about 7 and then fall back to 4 so that lower oil pressure is normal as it speeds up it will all correct itself so in um, in comparison with the Airbus the Boeing's a little bit different in the Airbus the power is um, switched between the different systems automatically as you turn them on and off. In the Boeing you have to do it yourself. There's a bus transfer panel here and we'll see this in a moment. So this light will come on in the middle meaning we can pull power from the APU. So we're just starting the APU and it's stabilizing. This light will come on when it's ready. There we go. So the APU is now up and running, the auxiliary power unit, the small jet engine in the tail that generates electric and compressed air. So if we flick these two switches down, we are now using the APU. OK, so we can go and turn the anti-collision lights to on. We're going to press Control and 3 to go down to the FMC. We're going to go to the menu page, FS Actions, Ground Services, and we're going to ask them to release the ground power. We don't need it anymore. So if we go and look outside the aeroplane, if you go into the tail, you'll see there's heat pouring out of this little hole at the back. That's the exhaust port of the auxiliary power unit. OK, so we've removed the ground power. So if we can go back overhead now, Oh, while we're down there, sorry, I almost forgot, we can remove the chocks. And in the simulator, that is a trigger 
As soon as you remove the chocks, the doors close and the stairs are taken away. So, okay, so overhead, we're going to start getting ready to start the engines. So we can go and put the fuel pumps on. We can go and turn on the APU bleed. So that's allowing the compressed air from the APU to get to the engines to spin them up. And we perform pushback at this point. So I'm going to just press Shift and P. And you'll see the tractor come in. I'm going to remove the parking brake. I'm just going to push back in a straight line. The key here is the engines will not be started until pushback is happening. Yeah, because obviously in real ground operations the crew get the hell away from the aeroplane. Because you don't want any human beings walking around as the engines are spooling up. There have been accidents in the real world. So in the real world, obviously, engine start is already happening. We've only got one pair of hands. This is the continual struggle of flight simulator. Having to keep an eye on pushback and at the expense of being able to do the startup at the same time. So we'll just give ourselves enough room to spin around here. So push back a bit further. Then we'll stop the pushback. Engage the parking brake. It's a good point actually, I'm not sure, yeah, it doesn't actually do it in this aeroplane, it's disengaged. What you have to do is hold the tow brakes on, and then you can pull up the parking brake which engages it. Okay. So if you've got a Thrustmaster Quadrant, it won't work with the parking brake in the 737. Anyway. So we have completed pushback, so how do we do engine start? We go to this panel up here. We choose an ignition system, the right or the left ignition system. So it doesn't matter which. We switch engine number two's ignition system to GRD. And then we come and look down. And you should find the N2 number is climbing for engine number two. When it gets to 20, we can advance the start lever for engine number two, which will introduce fuel and ignite it. Okay, so watch the fuel flow and the exhaust gas temperature go up. I just realised I didn't turn the centre tanks on. It's one of the classic things that I miss, especially when I'm talking. It's so easy to get distracted showing somebody something interesting and missing out half the checklist. I've done it so many times. Right, the click you just heard was the ignition system switch going back to off. As soon as it's done that, you can start the other engine. So GRD, notice we can use the same ignition system. It really doesn't mind. So the N2 number is coming up. N2 is the speed of the gas turbine. So this is the gas turbine being spun up. So it gets to 20% of its uh, nominal top speed and we can introduce fuel with the starter lever. So you'll see the fuel number go up and the exhaust gas temperature go up and then the N1 number is the speed of the turbofan on the front of the engine. So you've got the gas turbine and the turbofan. So if we have going to have a look at the engines, you can see there's two parts to the engine. There's the gas turbine in the middle and then there's these enormous fans on the front. And if you look back from the back, you can, it's quite difficult to see on this aircraft, but yeah, the fan is outside. It's interesting how turbofans work. The hot air from the gas turbine pushes a fan at the back of the axle, which drives the fan at the front of the axle. So the, the blades are freewheeling. They're not actually connected to the gas turbine, no, not directly. Okay, so engines are running. So as soon as the engines are running, if we go and press Control 6 to look overhead, you can see we can bus transfer now over to the engines away from the APU. So we can do that. So we're now using the, the gas turbine engines to generate power for the aircraft. 
which means we can turn off the APU bleed now and we can turn off the APU. We can now go and turn on the hydraulic pumps which gives us all of the control surfaces being able to be moved around properly. We can turn on the, the packs which is part of the environment control system. So this is pressurising the cabin properly now. We can turn the taxi lights to on. So while taxiing we might want to move the flaps to take off position. So we'll move the flap lever over there. I'm doing it with my controls to 5 degrees. And we're going to go and line up on the runway. So let's go and have a little look at the map and find out which way we go to get to runway 18. So we just need to do a right turn and then follow the taxiway basically up to the holding point for run eight for one eight. So to release the parking brake we have to hold the tow brakes on and that releases the parking brake automatically. Okay, so then we let go, we ease the throttles forwards, and we're rolling. and taxi across to taxiway. Be mindful not to go too fast. Okay, so what do we need to think about? Position lights. Position lights are over here. We're going to put them onto strobe. We're doing this a little bit ahead of time. You wouldn't normally do this until you get to the wrong way. We're going to go and put the landing lights on as well. Again, the ordering of these last few bits and pieces, different people will tell you different things. So we're just looking for the, the TCAS system, and it's here. So we just need to put it onto TARA. That's the Traffic Collision Avoidance System. To be honest, on takeoff, you'd normally have it on TA, not TARA. So it's Traffic Advisory. So it means the airplane, the autopilot, if we've got it switched on, won't respond to an advisory. TARA, the autopilot, will, may actually take avoiding action. So to switch on the display of um, traffic collision avoidance system, you press the TFC button and that puts the range rings on the navigation display. Okay, so we'll just hold here and check we've done everything we need to do. I think we have. We can take off or pull out onto the runway. So you can see the navigation display is slowly rotating around towards us. Let's reduce the range on it so we can see a bit more clearly. I'm wondering why I haven't got the magenta lines for the flight directors. I'm wondering if there's a bug going on here. I don't think I've done anything wrong. The 
sim is stuttering like crazy. No idea why. Okay. Well, we should also have um, rejected takeoff anti-skid set. We haven't, but we have now. asking us to rotate, so we pull back no more than three degrees a second. Positive rate of climb. Okay, so then the gear can come up. And come off the throttle a little bit. We can start trimming. The flaps can start coming up. Once the gear is up, it can remove to the or come back to the off position, and we are just flying the route out to the the first marker. So at this point, if you wanted to, you could go and turn the autopilot on. So auto. Interesting. Yeah, there's a bug going on. Look. Oh no, it's gone to N1. Sorry. Yeah. So it's following the because we're using VNAV. If you go and look on the legs page, it's following the speed restrictions. Yeah, so you can see the target airspeed on the ribbon. It won't appear up here if it's in VNAV. It will appear as a target here. So you'll get a number above the ribbon and an arrow. So it's gone to 250 knots and it's holding it and it's coming out to 6,000 feet and it will hold it. So it's interesting to watch in the Boeing because you can see the throttles move when it varies the the power output required. So you can see we're coming up to that first turn. So gear is up, flaps are up. There we go, remember what I said about the throttles? So it's maintaining climb rate, stopping accelerating, go for 250 knots, and it's starting to level out as well, because we're coming up to 6,000. So at this point we would be talking to ATC saying we're approaching 6,000 feet and we would be uh, request higher and they would come back to us and maybe say, you know, climb to your cruise altitude of 18,000. So we would say 18,000 and we do a level change. And at this point the speed appears. But we could use VNAV as well to do the same trick. It's just I, I like to show different things in the cockpit, different ways of doing it. So level change will take you at the best rate it can for the speed you've selected to the altitude you've selected. So notice it's going for 93% by the look of it on the engines. That'll be down to that climb um, template we selected. good isn't it? <laughs> I do like the 737, it's nice and predictable. Ah, we now have the flight directors. I wonder why they weren't showing earlier. It's odd. Maybe they only show when the autopilot's on then. Seems a bit odd. Never noticed that before. So here we go, look, we're making the turn you can control the maximum bank angle that the aircraft can use. It's just below the heading. There's this rotary switch. It goes between 10 and 30 degrees. So you can allow the aeroplane to bank more sharply if you need to. You need to be careful though at low speeds that you don't stall if you put high bank angles in. So we've come up through the transition altitude, which was 7,000 feet. So we're going to go and press the standard altitude button now. We've also come through 10,000 feet, so the landing lights can come off. So something that's worth looking at here, looking on the legs page, it will 
keep the next waypoint at the top of the page all the time so it kind of throws away places you've been and you get these um, distances to count down along the way if you go route data you can see ETAs for each waypoint if you go back to legs you can see the same data again if you go to the progress page that gives you distance to go and ETA for the next few legs So at the moment we're flying out the route of that standard instrument departure. So you can see the aeroplane is, notice it's automatically crabbing for the crosswind. So at this altitude we've got a 43 knot crosswind. So the aeroplane is automatically dealing with it. You can see it's displayed here, look. And it will make this turn extremely accurately. Yeah, instead of, instead of flying through uh, Pi Ben, it's turning before it gets there to meet the next part of the route absolutely perfectly. Let's get rid of that out of the way. It's very, very clever. If we go outside, we should be able to see the airfield be left. There it is. So we flew down that way, done a U-turn, and we're coming back and they're turning off towards our destination. So we're still saying only 250 knots. We could accelerate now out to 320. So you will notice it will lower the nose in order to accelerate. You also get a green marker next to the indicated airspeed showing the rate of change. So we've just come up to 18,000 feet as well. So we've leveled out. We're at cruise altitude now. So again, auto throttle is on. So when it gets to 320 knots, it will pull the engine throttles back on its own just to maintain 320. Obviously we can increase the range on the map display. not a very long route at all today. So notice we've got top of descent is marked in. We'll start descending shortly before that so we get plenty of time to talk about things on the way. This is basically your last chance to descend without playing all kinds of games with spoilers. And we're going with the wind, so that's a factor we have to think about, yeah. So we may not be able to lose speed as easily as we might like. We'll be covering the ground at 50 knots towards the destination. Faster than we might like. Let's have a look on that side. Gorgeous part of the world, isn't it? Pulled the engines back to 80% look. Flaps are up, spoilers are up. Everything's looking good. It pays to look around and do a scan every so often just to see if there are any warnings anywhere. So the magenta lines I was on about earlier, that's the flight director. So that's where the system that's following the route is telling the aeroplane the control 
inputs need to go. So at the moment it's going, you know, just keep it flying in a dead straight line. But if it needs to impart a turn, you'll see the crosshair move sideways. If it needs to climb or descend, you'll see the horizontal bar move up or down. And then you'll see the autopilot chase it. Okay, so we've got about uh, 60 miles to go until we get to top of descent. So I'm going to go and make a quick coffee while we have a chance to relax <laughs> and then we'll manage the descent down into you can see our aeroplanes coming along here in Navagraph and we'll manage the descent down into here we'll do it from Little Nav Map though because I know people like Little Nav Map because it's free so you can see yeah we've got quite a way to go yet and we don't really need to descend until we're almost at Ulmug leave it on this screen so you can see the progress being made. I'll maybe zoom in a little bit on here so you can see those markers coming and I'll be back in a moment. about 30 miles from top of descent. So if we go and look at a little love map, we need to be below 15,000 feet when we get to Old Mug. Okay, so you can see the line here and when we select a waypoint in little love map you get a green circle around it. It's also worth pointing out that you can move the arrow along the elevation plot and it gets you a, a marker as well on the map when you do it. So if you're looking at a particular hill, say if we were much lower, um, you can see on the map where it refers to by the, the, the marker circle that moves along. So it's really useful, especially somewhere like you know, Switzerland or New Zealand where you've got lots of mountains you might want to traverse. Okay, so how do we manage this descent? 
we want to come down to, we need to be below 15,000. So let's go and come down to at least 12 then. Or let's, let's go for 10. Because that's where the point where we would need to start doing things. Like turning the nav lights back, sorry, the um, landing lights back on. So we're flying along. And we're going to come down to 10,000 feet. Now if we did that with VNAV, notice it's not doing anything yet because it doesn't need to. Yeah, so in VNAV mode it will go to the target altitude when at the last moment basically. So we might want to start slowing down now rather than trying to decelerate later but we'll see how we go. So it, another way of doing it would be say we want to go to 10,000 feet. Let's do a level change to get there. Notice we get to choose our speed, and it's in a Mach number because we are at 18,000 feet. Oh, it's just switched back, look. So the throttles have been pulled back automatically, so we don't accelerate. And it's descending really rather rapidly. So notice you get this line appears, they call it the green banana. That's the at the point on the route where you will reach the... Um, the altitude you have targeted. So another one rather than level change mode you can use is vertical speed mode. So we could go to vertical speed mode and say we'll only come down at say 1500 feet a minute but leave the auto throttle on so it can carry on doing say we tell it to do 330 knots and you can tune it yeah to get to your desired point in the sky at the speed and rate you want to. So we're using vertical speed mode just to come down in a, a sedate manner, let's put it that way. So let's zoom in a little bit more. So we can see there's Olmug. So notice we'll also have to get to 250 knots once we get to 10,000 feet. It'd be worth pointing out, or worth having a quick look and finding out what is the transition altitude at Sunderfjord. So if we go and look at the approach chart, it should say it on it somewhere. 7,000 feet again. So when we come down through 7,000 feet, we need to know what the weather is doing in Sunderfjord to find out the barometric pressure. So in Navigraph, you can do that by going to the information for the airport, and you can go to the weather, and it will tell you it's 1017 hectopascals or 30.03 inches. If you do it in little nav map, if you double click on TORP, it will bring up an overview and in there you will get the weather and you'll get a queue and then the barometric pressure and it's in hectopascals obviously here. Yeah. So remember that number 1017 and we'll switch this into hectopascal mode ready to do that. So we are descending, that's the point we need to be below 15,000, we already are, so it's not a concern to us. Notice it's only saying below, so we don't have to be, sometimes you will have both numbers above and below, so if you're weaving in between other airspaces, sometimes you'll have an exact altitude to be at on the way through a waypoint. So if you remember, we need to be above three, sorry, above four thousand at Mopap. So we're just coming in at the moment towards Elmug. Altitude's bleeding off. So let's start playing with getting rid of the airspeed down to 250 knots. If 
we want to help the airplane do it we can engage the speed brakes and you'll see that will expedite the deceleration of the aircraft. It seems a shame to always focus on the instruments when you've got amazing views outside, doesn't it? This part of um, Norway is absolutely incredible. Okay, so we're still going downhill, but we will level out, so the speed will come off a lot faster once the nose comes up, once we get to 10,000 feet. So we're just approaching 10,000 feet now. The beep you heard a moment ago is just the aircraft warning us that we're within 1,000 feet of our target altitude. Okay, nose is coming up gently to hold 10,000 feet, and the speed is falling off now really rather rapidly. If you're wondering why it takes a while to slow down, well, we've got 70 tonnes worth of aeroplane, that's why. Okay. So notice the aircraft has switched off vertical speed mode all on its own. Now we've got to the target altitude. And we can take the speed brakes back off. The aeroplane's now maintaining 250 knots. We're at 10,000 feet, so in preparation for coming down further, landing lights can come on. We'll zoom in again on the display. We might want to have, this is where having a pilot and co-pilot independence displays on an accurate aircraft. It's really useful because you can have different zoom levels on each side. So we want to be above 4,000 feet at MOPAP. So let's go for 5,000 feet at MOPAP then. So let's say five. And let's come down vertical speed mode. And we'll come down at 1,000 feet a minute and see where that puts us. Might not be steep enough. Let's go for 2,000 feet a minute. Notice the throttles are coming back to, in, to make sure we don't. Now this is interesting though, this is what I wanted to happen. It can't hold speed. So I've, I've put the spoilers out. This is the danger of using vertical speed mode. This is why you use level change mode. It doesn't have this issue with level change mode. So in level change it's coming down as quickly as it can, but it's also decelerating, so it's lifting the nose to make that happen. So now we've got to the airspeed we want, the nose will come back down. See it's just dipping now. It's still not coming down really well enough, so we're going to go and put the spoilers out which means the aircraft can descend that bit more steeply because it's more draggy, so it won't accelerate downhill. So using level change mode in combination with the spoilers lets you play these games. I'm really doing all these things on purpose, all, you know, lots of different ways of doing things to illustrate the dangers of vertical speed mode. You could ask for a vertical speed where the aeroplane can't maintain its speed. You know, even on idle, on the throttles, it can't do it. So we come down through 7,000 feet very soon. So we said we wanted 1017 hectopascals. So 7,500 feet at the moment. So let's go and press it. 1017 we want. So there we go, 1017 hectopascals. So now our altitude is accurate to the airfield. So we're gonna turn left and then right and then right and we'll be on to the ILS. So we also need to go and check the ILS frequency. So we want 108.3 and a course of 175 degrees. So let's turn the course round to 175 degrees on both um, sides of the cockpit. So 
So we'll also go and remind ourselves we want to be. Uh, yeah, I'll show you this in little now map so you can see it. We want to be above 3,000 feet at Bapto. So we're going to come down now to 3,500. Well, 3,000. Yeah, 3,500 is fine. So we're, we're still on level change mode because we're still on our way down. We hadn't got to 5,000 yet, look. So all we've done is recalibrated what, what we're doing. You can see the green banana is saying we're going to get there then. So we need to go and reacquaint ourselves with the ILS. So 108.3. So there are two nav radios. So we want 10830. And we transfer that to active. We want 10 0830 and we transfer that to active so I'll show you the symbology in a minute when we turn back towards the runway it will all make sense we're starting to lose speed again now so let's come down to 200 knots again we can throw the spoilers out which will help we're at three and a half thousand feet now. You can see why there are altitude restrictions. Yeah, any closer. Or if we got down to three thousand feet, we'd not be far off these hilltops. So let's zoom in again on the display so we can see the, the turn happening. We'll zoom in on the other side as well because we will be switching this over to nav uh, landing well, approach mode sorry on the the navigation display so you get to see the symbology basically so we're at 200 knots now so spoilers can come off So let's go back a bit further, 180 knots. So the gear can come down now. Landing lights are already on. <coughs> and the flaps can come on. There we go. We sit down in the cockpit we can see the flap traveling over here flaps are in transit and you can see the needle moving so they've gone through one degrees and then two degrees sit up so we can see over the outside and see what's going on so we're turning in towards the airfield and then we'll turn again in a moment. So at this point we can drop for 3000. Again we can do a level change to make that happen. Because we have the flaps out now they're quite draggy so the drag the aeroplane has available to it is quite significant. So we're just dropping the flaps a bit further. speed a bit further so we're coming down to 3,000 feet and we've now got the glide slope has appeared yeah because we tuned in the nav radios they've picked up the glide slope when we turn in towards the airfield you'll see the localizer as well will come up as a great big diamond it's important if we're going to use approach mode that we switch it on while we are below the glide slope So we're at 10 degrees flap, which is in the ballpark. So we'll pull it back to 160 knots. So the airfield's out there somewhere, I think. Oh no, there it is there. You can just see it in the mist. There's the runway. 
So we are approaching the glide slope. So remember it wanted us at 3,000 feet, above 3,000 actually, so we're right on 3,000 feet, so we're being a little bit naughty there. So let's turn this into approach mode on the navigation display. So you can now see a horizontal situation indicator and the glide slope, so we're going to go to approach mode. So the aeroplane's now going to intercept the glide slope and start descending. You see there goes the vertical speed. So we're going to switch on both autopilots now. So there's the runway. We've got a 30 knot crosswind which is why we're pointing this way. We're flying that way and pointing this way. The autopilot's doing it for us. So we're going to start winding the speed out. See a notice look? I did that on purpose for you. We've asked for a speed we can't do, given the configuration of the aeroplane, so we're dropping the flaps further. So we're going for full flaps now and asking it to go for 140 knots. And it's quite happy doing that now. Look, now it's got the flaps. So I'm kind of I'm trying to fit as much into this as I possibly can. It probably looks like a mad scramble at times. So you can see the runway coming. Normally you'd be sat down here watching this. I'm kind of sitting up so we can see lots, but I guess this is good as well. So the aeroplane is holding the glide slope and the localizer fully automatically. Notice the symbology above is showing what's going on. Now I don't think with single channel you can do flare mode so we'll keep an eye on it. That's the radar altimeter, by the way. Oh no, it has done flare mode, so it's picked up now that it can do it. If you don't get flare mode, it won't do auto land. Okay, so in the real aircraft, the pilot or well, the crew wouldn't let the aeroplane do everything on its own, so we'll Turn the autopilot off, we are in control now, so just give the wings a waggle. 1000. Just so we can <laughs> prove it's us. Let's um, turn the auto throttle off as well, and you get a little silent red flashing light there, so we'll turn that off as well. Let's get rid of some speed, we want about 130 knots. So we're just keeping half an eye on the glide slope marker down there. Half an eye on the speed. And half an eye out of the window. So you need more eyes than, than you've actually got to do this. 500. You can now see the puppy lights alongside the runway. You're looking for two white lights and two red lights. If you see more than two white lights, you're too high. If you see more than two red lights, you're too low. Notice the wind has turned around, so and it's got less as we've got lower. That's absolutely normal. We're a bit low. Quite often in flight simulator, yeah, you can see it here, the glide slope doesn't agree with the puppy lights. Okay. 50. So pull the throttles. 30, 20, 10. And we're down. Okay, so if you've got reversers and you've got them configured, you can use them. They're not tremendously effective. You could obviously deploy the spoilers as well and the wheel brakes and usually stop quite quickly. So we've got full flaps, full spoilers, and a little bit of wheel brakes. And then we can start retracting everything and roll in. So before we come off the runway, we want to go and turn the landing lights back off. And then strobe lights can come back to solid instead of flashing, if I can hit the switch for them. 
and not miss the turn. There are some things that would be much more, much easier in a real aeroplane than in a simulator, and that involves craning. That includes craning across the um, the cabin to hit switches quickly. Okay, so while we're taxiing in, on anticipation that you may not have um, a power generation at the gate, you could go and switch the APU back on so it will come back to life while we're taxiing. So then the idea there is by the time you come to a halt you will already have the APU available to shut the engines down. So we'll go around the back of this Ryanair. Actually no we could go straight in here can't we? So hopefully, I mean we covered an awful lot in this video and we raced through some things, So, but hopefully it was interesting and gave you an idea of some of the things you can go practice and play with. And I really only scratched the surface, there's a whole world of things you can do in the flight management computer of the Boeings, things like holds, um, you can put custom waypoints in, you can fly a beam courses, all, all sorts of things. Okay, so we're come to a halt so we hold the tow brakes on and then we can pull the parking brake up and let go so we've engaged the parking brake if we go and have a look the APU is available the light has come on so we can switch over to using the APU internally and then that means we can pull the starter levers for the engines and shut them down okay so, the job then is just going around the aeroplane, turning everything off that we turned on earlier. There's not much to it really. Uh, we got the fuel, we need to leave at least one fuel, remember, one fuel pump on for the APU. Um, bus transfer is fine as it is, the packs can come off. We can <laughs> turn the seatbelt sides. I wish they had a sound effect for absolute mayhem behind us when we turn the seatbelt sign off. <laughs> we can turn off the emergency exit. Normally you wouldn't do that until the APU is off, I guess, because you've still got powered systems on the aircraft. Um, overhead we can go and, whoops, um, wrong button. Seven, is it? There we go. Turn off the inertial navigation system. We can turn the anti-collision lights off. We can turn the position lights to off. We can turn the taxi lights to off. And we're pretty old. We do, the center fuel pumps can come off. Um, Trying to think if we did anything else. The TCAS, we haven't turned TCAS off yet. So put it back to standby. And we never used the transponder because we didn't need to because we weren't talking to the ground anyway. So yeah, once you got to that point, you can just go overhead, turn off the APU, which will lose power to most of the systems. Exit lights off, battery off. Oops, that turns it back on. I always forget that. And there you go. So it's not actually that difficult to, you know, get the 737 up and running. It's it's refreshingly mechanical, which after the Airbus, I th I really like. I like the way it works, the way it's kind of, um, yeah, mechanical. <laughs> so hopefully you enjoyed that. Obviously there's lots of other functions in the, the tablet, so you, sorry not in the tablet, in the FMC you can go and get the you know the doors open and the stairs out and all the rest of it. I'm not going to go into that today because there's a whole world of things this aeroplane can do. And today we were really looking at SIDS and STARS. And yeah, it was a bit manic in those last few minutes because we were doing a lot in a hurry. But that's the way it sometimes is. And you imagine the workload if you've got a controller and you're getting vectored because maybe someone's done a go around and there's other airplanes in the airspace, which means the paperwork goes out of the window. 
and you're being given vectors to fly, you know, a direction and an altitude and a speed. And suddenly it's, it's down to you to know the, your way around these cockpit controls quickly and easily, which, you know, you can pick up very quickly just through practice, really. And that's what a simulator's for, for practicing. So hopefully you enjoyed that. We had a bit of a look at SIDS and STARS there today, and we looked at various ways of controlling the, the Boeing 737-600, which is the best value study level jet in the simulator by quite some distance. So go and visit PMDG and go and find out. I think it might be in the marketplace as well now, actually, the 737-600. Go and have a look at it if you've never tried it before. Okay, I'll see you again soon.